Welcome to everybody. I'm delighted to be here again. This is always a high point of the year to talk about this subject. The point of interest in nanotechnology is that it's something one hears a lot about and you are in the business of talking about this subject to people who are interested in or are not interested in science. And a good question is, is it something which they should pay attention to? Is it something you should pay attention to? Why is it interesting? What is it? And I want to try to give you a quick run through a lot of stuff to give you enough of a feeling for the landscape that you know where nano is situated in phase space and generally what its parts are. How many wings does it have? How many legs does it have? What color is it? It's that kind of thing. And I'm sure there's going to be lots of room to talk about it further as you progress onward during the day. So the three topics are these three. The obvious one is what is it? And the answer to that is not entirely clear. Of course, it's small things, but small means what and why does anyone care? Second issue is why is it interesting? And five years ago, 10 years ago, when the area first emerged, the answer to that question was not at all clear. It's now getting to be pretty clear. I think we can say where nano is going to make a difference and why. So at least there's a point of focus for the discussions. And then the final issue is, is it really going to be something that changes the world and is this a good thing or a bad thing? Um, it is. It is regardless of its character for a variety of reasons which we'll talk about and the better or worse is a good thing to talk about with students. So let me give you an idea of what some of the major scientific and technological themes are. The one that is certainly making the biggest impact in the shortest period of time is electronics. And people say, will there be a nanoelectronics? The answer is there already is a nanoelectronics. I mean, it's already a big deal. It has happened. It will continue to happen. And its consequences are enormous, enormous for the world, not necessarily strictly as a result of nano. I mean, it's electronics that makes the difference, but nano is going to be a part of it, and the key part of it to pay attention to is memory, because information is going to be free. Materials, you know, materials is stuff. It's the floor and the clothes, and you know, I could knock gently on your head, but you're, we're all materials. Anything that you can put your hands on Materials make up the world, nano makes up materials, and so there are many, many different contributions of nanoscience in this area. The question is, what are the applications going to be? Functional structures. It is my belief, which time will tell whether it's correct or not, that the biggest area for nano is probably going to be on the area of what I'll call commodity infrastructure, which is production of energy, <coughs> production of water, the things that go into maintaining, um, maintaining the flow of these major commodities of, of, that are responsible for environmental maintenance and things of that kind. It's already an important part of these areas, but it's becoming rational, and we'll chat about that as we go on. Everyone's interested in medicine. The answer in medicine right now is not clear. It's not clear that it's going to be a revolution. It's certainly going to be an important contribution. And then, of course, one of the big areas of interest is research, because what nano is enabling us to do for the first time is to see the world, the physical world, at a resolution and a scale that's been impossible in the past. So you add those up, and it's a, it's a big deal. Lots of interesting stuff. Now, I think it's always a good idea to think about why people do something. And this actually varies a lot from area to area of science. Why, for example, did nuclear energy emerge? And the answer to that is to be pretty bloody-minded about it, that we and the Soviet Union were in a race for nuclear weapons. And out of that came power and things of that kind. But that was a technology that was fundamentally uh, weapons-driven, weapons national defense-driven. This area, I think, nano is a little bit more in the order of this. It's, it's exploration. But exploration has a little bit the sense of we set off with pure hearts to explore the new world. Actually, nobody goes off to see if there's an edge of the world that they can drive over or if it's possible to find a sea dragon that will eat the boat that you're on. That You just don't do that. You do it for another reason. And, you know, Columbus, when he went off, it was a mixture of probably some desire to get out of town, get away from his wife, 
some interest in making money, some interest in gaining stature in the court. I suspect he was testosterone poisoned, as many people are who are explorers. You know, there are lots of reasons for this, but it was not, not just pure science. It was a mixture of science, aggression, status-seeking, uh, profit, whatever. And that's the same thing here. It's a whole mixture of stuff, and all of them are mixed up in an interesting and neat way. But one of the, one of the acronyms I remember and try to operate by is WASP leg. And WASP leg is wrath, avarice, sloth, pride, lust, envy, gluttony. Those are the seven deadly sins. And I think it's good to remember them and then also arguably to practice them because they provide such good motivation for much of the world. Let's start with dimensions. There are a couple of different ways of thinking about nano. A nanometer, how big is a nanometer? Um, a micron, let's start with a hair. A hair is 100 microns. A nanometer is a thousandth of a micron, so a nanometer is a hundred thousandth of a hair. Um, hairs come in different sizes. Some hairs are more evident than other hairs. But the smallest thing that you can see with most eyes is about the diameter of a hair, and it's 100 microns. It's about the limit of visibility. So go down by 100,000, and what you get to are things that are the size of molecules, and that's a nanometer. So a typical molecule is about a nanometer in size. And these are the sorts of analogies. This is one which I find useful. If you think about my favorite mountain, which is Denali, uh, because it, it sits on a plane that's quite low here. You see the entire mountain. The ratio of that to that is 10 million, and the ratio of a baby's finger to a molecule is about 10 million. So it's small. And here's the scale that you've seen on many occasions. That's a hair at 100 microns. Spores for pollen are down somewhere around 10. Red blood cells are perhaps 3 microns. Viruses are down around 100 nanometers. Molecules are down around a nanometer. And the reason why, in terms of science, this area has been so interesting is that there's a region down here with molecules, which is what chemistry has done. It makes molecules, and we actually have a pretty good sense of a lot of that. And then there's a region up here, which one can see microscopically, and which has also been the region that people make things top down. They fabricate circuits and do things of that sort in that scale. And the region in between down in here, for a variety of reasons, has been difficult to look at, difficult to manipulate, difficult to access, so that people didn't really know what was here very clearly. And it's a reason to be particularly interested in that intermediate stage. It's not that it's the smallest thing around. It's between what you can do from the top down in size, from large scales going to smaller, and from what you can do from the bottom up, which is little molecules going to bigger molecules. So what is it? We tend to think of the area in terms of structure. So the definition, the current definition of nano is that it's less than 100 nanometers. Really, it's less than about 50 nanometers. So 50 small molecules lined up end to end. Or if you want to think about it in terms of atoms, a gold atom is half a nanometer in size. So 50 nanometers is 100 gold atoms in a line. So that's a, that's a good dimension. Synthetically, we've said top down to bottom up. The part that's more interesting is functionally. And the world is basically constructed on function. You, know, it's, you, you don't ask what is it, you ask what does it do, and that's the function. And so there are two sets of things here that are functional. One is that there are a series of uses in catalysts, in pores, in membranes, in memories, and a bunch of other things which we'll talk about. And then there's also another issue which has just begun to be exploited, which is that philosophically one of the most interesting things about the world to me is that I am made up of atoms, you are made up of atoms, which are quantum objects, and you are a classical Newtonian object. So if I drop you, you go splat. I understand that. If I take an atom and I send it at the wall, it can go through it, which you can't go. So what happens in between? How does something that's a collection of quantum objects which we cannot understand become a classical object? 
And that transition occurs in this region of nanometer scale stuff. So if you're interested in the subject of what is the nature of what we loosely call reality, this is the area that you'd like to look at carefully. Now, there are also a couple of other interesting issues from your point of view. One of them is that nano is not fresh bread. That is to say, it's not the answer to everything. I'll show you what I mean by that in just a moment. Often, what we're concerned with is small, because small brings portability, it brings low reagent costs, it brings high speed, it brings all sorts of other characteristics. And then also, from the point of view of public understanding, People don't know the difference between nano and micro and submicro. You know, all that stuff is not important. Either you can see it or you can't see it, basically. And so what one is concerned with are things that are small enough that you can't see them and you can get a lot of them in a small space. That, that's basically the issue. So atoms are very, very small and nanometer scale structures are sort of small and micro is just barely small, but that's all distinctions. Here are just examples of what I mean by different scales of small. This is a true nanostructure. This is a ring of gold, and the walls of this ring are 40 nanometers. That's 80 gold, gold atoms across, and it's a kind of circular structure. And you say, that's sort of neat. What's it good for? And the answer is, I have no clue, you know, which sort of symbolizes nano. This is one of the things that will change your life. This is a prototype of a radio frequency ID tag. And it's a passive device in which you have an antenna. And then there are some little structures down there in the middle. And the reason why it's interesting is that it's passive. You, we, these are going to be used in the following way. You go to the supermarket. And right now, we have a human interaction still in the supermarket. You buy a head of cauliflower, and you talk to the supermarket clerk who's in a good humor or a bad humor. With this, the head of cauliflower has one of these little tags on the bottom. And as you leave, you go through a portal, like the portal at the, the airport. And the portal will read. It talks to this, and it says, what were you? And it says, I'm a head of cauliflower. And where were you? And I was on the second shelf to the left on aisle three. What kind of cauliflower were you? What size cauliflower were you? All this information gets passed back and forth. And by the way, your bank account is debited in 10 to the minus three seconds after this transaction has occurred. So you eliminate all human contact at the, at the supermarket. And if you happen to fall in the marginal Asperger's case class that most of us do who are basically physical scientists, that's not a bad thing. But if you're otherwise human, it's problematic. So uh, 